Before introducing tonight's event, I'd like to read a brief statement that the university has prepared to acknowledge the land on which Roger Williams University resides. We recognize the unique and enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people and their traditional territories. We acknowledge that Roger Williams University's Bristol and Providence campuses are located within the homelands of both the Poconoke and Narragansett nations. Let this acknowledgement serve as a reminder of our ongoing efforts to reconcile and partner with the Narragansett and Poconoke and all indigenous peoples whose lands and waters we benefit from today. Thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge the benefactor of our Talking in the Library series. The events are generously supported by an endowment to the university library by an alumna of the university, Mary Tuft White, whose donation also made possible the program space in the library known as the Mary Tuft White Cultural Center. And that's the area that we would normally be meeting in instead of Zoom. This evening, our library program director, Professor Adam Braver, has put together an exciting and timely program entitled Daughters of Dissidents, the Humanitarian Effects of the Uyghur Crisis. Many thanks to Adam for all his work on this. We are happy to feature two speakers, Johar Ilham, whom we've been fortunate to host here at Roger Williams in the past. And for the first time, we'd like to welcome Akita Pulati. We are pleased to partner in presenting this program with the Scholars at Risk Network. In a moment, I will turn this over to their Director of Advocacy, Claire Robinson. But first, I'd just like to mention a few of the upcoming programs we are hosting this semester. As part of our Burst Memorial Program, which annually celebrates the anniversary of a great work of literature, we have selected Ernest Gaines' novel, The Autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman, for which we have prepared a virtual exhibit with facsimile materials from the Gaines Archive at the University of Louisiana Lafayette. On March 15th, we will host a panel of scholars to discuss this book. And on March 22nd, we will feature American novelist Adam Hazlett as part of the University Library's Vermont Fellowship for Fiction and Creative Nonfiction. We'll be sending out information about these programs soon, and they will be posted also on the library website. So I do hope you'll be able to join us. And now may I introduce Claire Robinson. Thank you, Betsy. I'm delighted to be here on behalf of Scholars at Risk. Uh, as many of you know, Scholars at Risk is an international network of over 500 higher education institutions in 39 countries committed to protecting the human rights of scholars and promoting academic freedom. We do this in part through creating temporary positions of academic refuge for threatened scholars, and in part through raising awareness and conducting advocacy in support of academic freedom and the increased protections for scholars. As Betsy noted, I direct Scholars at Risk's advocacy work. And in my role, I have the honor of partnering with Roger Williams University Professor Adam Braver and his students in coordinating and leading Scholars at Risk's Student Advocacy Seminar Program. Through this program, faculty-led teams of students conduct research and advocacy in support of imprisoned scholars. Over the years, two of the eminent academics these students have advocated for are economist Ilham Toti and ethnographer Rahila Dawut. The students have produced research briefs, met with government officials, written op-eds, raised awareness on campus and more. But in my opinion, the most important thing that they have done and that they continue to do is remind the scholars themselves and their families and colleagues that these scholars are not forgotten, that advocacy continues that work is happening and that there is hope. And that is part of what we are all doing here today in bearing witness and learning from Jahar and Akita and each other. So thank you for being here. Thank you for spending your time with us. And thank you, Roger Williams, for hosting this. Thank you, Claire. 
Um, I'm Adam Braver and I'm gonna get us going. Um, I wanna just start by saying that Johar Ilham first visited our campus in 2015 following a connection forged by work done uh, through the students and the ad advocacy seminars um, on behalf of her father, as well as through the work and personal connection that, that she and I shared um, over, those, over that time. Um, at the time, her father, Ilham Todi, had been given an unprecedented life sentence by the Chinese authorities for his peaceful work as a moderate voice trying to create dialogue between Uyghurs and Han. Johar visited the campus again in 2019. By then, during those in-between four years, so much had changed. Two years prior, in 2017, the so-called re-education camps had become a reality in the Uyghur region of China. And by then, scholars and intellectuals such as Rahila Dahut, Akita's mother, were disappearing. Too soon, the story ballooned from being one of selectively targeted individuals into one of an attack on an entire culture. Well over a million, all individuals. And to help us understand the experience of what it means to witness this and to advocate for change and for their parents, we welcome Johar and Akita, daughters of Ilham Todi and Rahila Dahoud. I'm gonna start off with a few questions for Johar and Akita. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions um, in the in the Q and A section here. So I encourage you, I encourage everybody to um, to type in questions. Um, I've been, uh, uh, I'm sure the conversation will be more interesting with everybody than with just me and Johar and Akita, um, or at least just me. Um, and um, we'll get going. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. So. The first thing I want to ask both of you is to, to just tell us about your parents a little bit. Tell, tell us, you know, uh, who Johar, who your father was, Akito, who your mother was. Um, help us, help us get to know them a little bit. Akita, would you like to start first? Sure. Uh, my mother, Rahila Zawud, she born in an intellectual family. Uh, she is a uh, professor at Xinjiang University. In um, 1998, she was one of the few Uyghur women to earn PhD degrees at uh, Beijing Normal University. She is also a uh, visiting scholar at foreign institutions such as the Indiana University, University of Washington, University of California, Berkeley. She the work she has she has done also received award from China Ministry of Cultures. After I said all about her work, you might imagine my mother as a workaholic or who devoted all of her time or energy to works. But it's more than that. Like the she also like except for her busy schedule. Like aside from her busy work, all of the like all of the accomplishment he, she achieved in her field, she is also a very responsible mother, daughter, and a uh, uh, wife. She, as a, except her busy, busy work schedule, she never forgot to make a nutritious and a delicious breakfast for me and my father. Every time when my grandparents and uh, her mother-in-law or, or father-in-law had any health issue, she would take them to the hospital and took care of them all days. All of her friends, all of her colleagues, all of her students love my mother because she has such a wonderful personality. She is open mind, accepted any dif differences, accepted any, accepted any the cultural differences and uh, she's so helpful whenever her students or friends needed help, she would be there for them. So that's why after her disappearances, all of the people who knows her devastated because the world lost, not only lost a excellent, a successful scholar, but lost a wonderful person. As a daughter perspectives, I grew up with my mothers and uh, as, as a daughter pers perspectives, I got many inspirations from my mothers. I witness like I witness how uh, how a 
how a person with such a busy work schedule can still enjoy life. I witness, I witness, I witness, I witness how a person with a certain cultural background can grow up with somebody that can ex that can be open minded and uh, accepted any any like any culture from any different any different groups i when i was a child i decided to become someone like my mother so her loss is a uh, such a devastating thing for me but also inspire me encourage me to become an activist and uh, speak up for 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 her i would love to uh Right now, I just wanted to tell you who my mother is, and uh, later on, I can talk more about my mother's disappearances and uh, why she was detained by the Chinese government. But I would love to uh, give this opportunity to the Jill Harris to introduce her father. Thank you, Akida. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jill Harris Ham. I am the daughter of jailed scholar Ibham Tohti. Some of you may uh, be uh, familiar with this name. Some of you might not uh, know. Uh, my father was a well-known economist in China. Uh, he was a professor at Minzu University in Beijing, um, though an economist by training, but he was best known in China as an um, outspoken advocate for Uyghur rights and also peaceful coexistence between the Uyghur people and the uh, majority Han Chinese. Uh, in early, in, in around 2006, uh, he, in order to, uh, for his way of promoting um, inter-ethnic understanding, he also co-founded the website UyghurViz.com. It was a platform that he wanted to provide for people um, to 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 free, to communicate with each other freely since social media accounts like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, and and searching engines like Google are all uh, banned in China. He wanted to create a free, um, non-blocked um, platform for people to be able to communicate with each other freely. And um, uh, uh, besides uh, besides creating the website, he also constantly. Um, uh, express his opinions and his views on his social media accounts, uh, his social media platforms, and uh, with the journalists. And he published op-eds, articles um, in, uh, regarding on the Uyghur and Han Chinese issues. He also, with throughout his uh, years of studies and researches, he realized that there are lots, lots of uh, social economical issues in the Uyghur region. And he, he would like to, my father is a fixer, when he sees a problem, can't help by trying to fix it. And um, therefore uh, he would reach out to government authorities and, and, uh, and, and propose a solutions, ideas on how the, how it can, how the situation can be improved. Um, but in, instead of, um, instead of um, accepting or listening to a, peaceful scholars' um, opinions, uh, opinions, and um, instead they, the government had uh, sentenced my father to life and also convicted him on the dubious charge of separatism. Um, the last time I saw my father was 2013, February 2nd, and that was the time wh when he was when he was invited by Indiana University as a visiting scholar and um, and I was only I was planning to come with my father to the U.S. just for a month uh, to help him settle down, but we were separated at the airport, and that was the last time I saw him. Eleven months after that uh, separation at the airport, he was officially arrested. And since 2017, and also as Adam said, the start of all those camps, so-called re-education camps, concentration camps, labor camps, whatever you call it. Um, since 2017, um, when mass number of uh, uh, camp started to appear, I have lost contact, uh, any information of my father. Family visits is no longer allowed. We don't know uh, what is my father's current condition. And um, we don't know if he's still being held in the same prison. We don't know if he's even alive. 
Thanks, Johar. Um, just briefly, and Johar, you touched on it already, but Akita, may, um, what brought you to the United States? So how, how have you ended up in the United States? Um, and uh, well, let's start there. And, um, and what's, your, what's your situation in the United States too? Uh, thank you so much for asking. So I came to the United States with F1 visa after I finished my universe, uh, undergraduate degrees in the Beijing, China. When I was studying on my undergraduate degrees, I, my mother always encouraged me to pursue advanced degree. I asked her like, what should I do after I gra after the graduations? Uh, instead of saying that you should get a job or you should get married, she said, you are young, you should, uh, you should, like, you are young, there is, you have many potentials, you need to see the world, you need to pursue advanced degree, you need to read more books and gain more knowledge when you are young, because once you get older, there might be a fewer chance, so I, can, I will support you, Un I will unconditionally support you, so that encouraged me to prepare for the GMAT examination, TOEFL examination, when I was was studying my when I was studying in Beijing after I finished my undergraduate degree I came to the United States to pursue my master's degrees and uh, so my life in the United States just start F since the 2015 June and your mother was here wasn't she for a while in the United States Yes. Uh, yeah. After after half years, I arrived at the United States. My mother came here as a visiting scholars in the same school in the University of Washington. Uh, that six month is the last period of of time I spent with my mother's. She could have transferred to a better school, but it, she just wanted to spend more time with me and uh, just supported just the. Uh, offer more support so she applied for the university of washington we spent almost six years six months here in the seattle's and uh, we we went to the library together we cooked together after after her work and after my study we went for a walk together that is the last happiest moment of my life in of, uh, last happiest moment in my life And Johar, you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, briefly, that I wasn't planning to come to come to the United States at all. I didn't even speak English. Um, in 2013, when my father was invited as a visiting scholar, uh, I was already a freshman student in college. My major was Arabic, and never expected that. Now, as you can see, I am still in America on the other side of the world from my apart from my family and and yeah, never gone back to China once. And I have to be honest, I don't think um, anything positive will will happen if I go back. Um, when that was the last time I was able to see my father. Uh, when after he was arrested at the airport, he was released at home after three days and put under house arrest for almost 11 months. And during that 11 month, um, I used to Skype with my father every single day, not even missing a day. And I believe that that was the best thing I have ever done. Um, um, I used to, my father and I, we used to Skype at least twice to three times a day just to check up on each other and see if each other are safe. And just like we would have regular father-daughter conversations and my father would ask me, what are you wearing to school? What did you learn at school? Who did you meet at school? And we try not to touch on those sad topics until few months, a uh, couple months prior to his uh, detention, my father 
uh, during one of our Skype call, he said uh, that he might, might, something might happen to daddy. And um, if I think it would be great if he creates social media accounts and daddy have friends all over the world, all around the world. They, I have never met most of them, but they will help you. And you need to stay, study hard, you need to stay strong. And at that point, I didn't want to accept the fact and I still kept hope. And I thought, I, I still believed nothing bad would happen. But January 14th, um, 2000, uh, January 15th, 2014, my father was taken away from our apartment in Beijing in front of my two little brothers. One of them was four years old. The other one was seven. The older one was deeply traumatized that he had heart issues uh, after a few months. Um, after my, and the day before he was officially taken away from our apartment was actually my last time spoke to him, uh, that I spoke to him um, because we kept communicating with each other every single day. And since he was arrested, I was never able to communicate with him again. Um, I did try to send a letter to him through his lawyer when he was first arrested. And um, my father said, study hard and be strong. And he always, always told me to be a strong girl. And I remember the last sentence he told me when we were being separated at the airport, he said, don't cry, don't let the other things, don't let other people think we little girls are weak. And that's what something my father would typically would usually say. <laughs> um, we're getting some questions in the, in the Q and A. Um, I, I wanna just take one more, I'll ask Akita actually, cause to follow up with what Johar was saying. Um, and Akita, you mentioned that, that you um, would, would talk about why your mother was, um, you know, or why, why she was detained or why you believe she was detained detained um, Johar obviously just explained what her father what what's your understanding of why she was detained uh, first off for, uh, for when my mother was first detained I kept silence for a while because I have no clues what's going on and uh, I was so naive at that time and I don't know like I don't know much about the persecutions we as a whole nation has been going through for decades. I rarely read any political news and I stay too much away from the politics. So when my, uh, during that time, my mom, before my mother's detained, I already heard about some news about like uh, the principal of the Xinjiang University was detained and the, this person mother was detained. I was heard several random news about uh, those horrible things. And uh, I was a little bit scary about this would happen to my family, but I still have like, I still like I was being too much positive. So when my mother was detained, I have no clue. I don't even know whether I should freak out or stay hopeful because I don't know what's going on. I was I, I didn't know what's going what what's going on tomorrow. Maybe my mother just show up, say hi, or maybe she disappeared forever. I have no clues, and uh, I stay silent at the beginning. Think like thinking maybe after several months, maybe after. Chinese government confirmed that my mothers would not cause any dangers to the chi to the Chinese China state. They would, and then after they can't, couldn't find any evidence about my mother committing any crimes, uh, my mothers would be released. And uh, after a long period of times, after I read all of the persecutions that the Uyghur has been going through for decades, after I witnessed the atrocity committed by the Chinese government in recent years, I lost hope for the Chinese, uh, for Chinese government. And uh, at that time I realized this is not about the what Chinese government, do, the reason the Chinese government detaining my mother is not about they suspect my mothers of committing crimes or they wanted to investigate and make sure my mother's not committing crimes. It's because this is go Uyghurs are going through a system, like they are, they wanted to systematically destroy Uyghurs nations. That is why they wanted to systematically detain and uh, imprison and 
de destroys the Uyghur intellectual scholars because they wanted to cut the roots of the Uyghur. The, they wanted to cut, they wanted to destroy Uyghur cultures by imprisonings and vanishings all of the Uyghur intellectuals. I love the Uyghur scholars, it, especially like my, like the, my, like my mother who is, who is, who, who, who has, who has done so much to, to preserving the Uyghur cultures. I, I, Began, I began to lose all of the hopes for the Chinese government and I think this is a atrocity. This is an unprecedented, unprecedented atrocity that the Chinese government is systematically embarking on. Thank you. And that, you know, that leads into some questions that are, that are in the, the, um, the, the Q&A that are um, all um, related. And, and part of that has to do with um, you know, what to do about that. And the questions from particular um, uh, particularly focused on, on, on government, on the U.S. So, you know, so how do we envision other states, especially the U.S., this is a question in the chat, um, doing to hold China accountable for the genocide, you know, given China's economic dominance within the international system? You know, is, is it military intervention? Is it sanctions? Is, is, is it something else? Another question that kind of follows along that path just to um, keep it going is, you know, is, you know, does this perhaps change of administration um, in the U.S., um, you know, going to help or, uh, or, or affect, you know, how is it going to affect it, maybe is a better way of asking the question. So first of what can be done, do you think, from, you know, what does China respond to from the U.S.? Um. I am not a policy expert. I do have a political science degree, undergrad degree, um, but um, just based on my personal experience for the past few years with my campaign, my campaigning experiences, and um, I believe that uh, with the current China, there is only one solution, which what people, I think it's an American saying, uh, um, hit, hit them where it hurts, is it, um, if I'm saying it correctly, and which I believe for China's current China, it will be um, money, which is uh, hitting, uh, hurting them in uh, financially or economically. In a, in a economically. So as um, some of you may know that 84% um, of the global cotton production is from the Uyghur region. Uh, I mean, 84% uh, of the cotton production of China is from the Uyghur region. And that accounts to 22% of the world cotton production. And that's just simple math. That's one out of five uh, garment industry that is entering the US or to the world is tainted with forced labor because now there are over one to 1.8 million Uyghurs are, have been going through vocational training and sent to uh, forced labor camps. That is why I do believe that putting sanctions on China um, uh, over, uh, let's say, goods that are made or produced in the Uyghur region or even outside of the Uyghur region since there is labor transferring program in, that is happening in China where Uyghurs all have been sent to different um, provinces and cities in, in China to work in factories for uh, very low wage wages or even no, no payment at all under very crucial uh, certain uh, environments. So I do believe that sanctions would be a useful uh, and a very efficient way to, to help um, uh, improving the forced labor issue for the, for the Uyghurs. And I believe one of the reasons that those forced labor camps even existed is because China would like to use it as, a, as of course, free labor or almost free or cheap labors. And if, if, um, international brands and corporates stop working in the Uyghur region, stop sourcing from those uh, from the region, stop sourcing products that are made by the Uyghurs. And if, um, in, in, if US or other governments, uh, they can start putting sanctions on goods such as the recent WRO that were released um, by the CBP, um, um, that all cottons and, and tomatoes that are made in the Uyghur region are going to be banned and not allowed to be entering the US. And I do uh, suggest, recommend other governments can follow suit and propose similar sanctions or, or orders because I do think it's a it's in a very effective way. 
Um, but what matters the most is not the sanctioning, it's how the enforcement. Um, normally governments, uh, from what I've been seeing, governments would uh, make a genocide declaration or would raise conversation about this Uyghur, uh, Uyghur issue, but uh, in, when it comes to actual enforcement, they often hesitate. Um, I do, I do understand that because if I, I'm a president of a country, I would care about um, my country's own economic growth. So I totally understand, but I do um, suggest people should value humanitarian, humanitarian crisis, uh, humanity over monetary gain. And, um, and I do believe that um, I'm sure a few con countries might be afraid of retaliation from China. But if one country is afraid of, uh, China might not be afraid of one country's sanction, two countries sanction, but if all the countries are united and, and working together on the specific matter, it's not to boycott China and it's not to cause problems for China, it's to help China to fix its own mistakes. And I, I, I do believe positive outcomes will come. Sorry, I talked too much. <laughs> That's fine, Joe. Let me ask you a quick follow-up that actually comes from the, that just came in from the chat um, and, and Akita, feel free to jump in too, um, is uh, the, the, pan, uh, the, the question asked, do you think it's an issue that among US politicians that some of the most vocal advocates of Uyghur human rights have also been some of the most controversial um, US politicians, you know, that have been people that have been considered to be, you know, very conservative, very far right then, and, and have not been uh, necessarily politicians in the mainstream. Akita, would you like to uh, uh, answer this question? And uh, if you don't have a switch, I, I, I can't go ahead. I would just want, because I just talked a lot earlier, so. <laughs> I can't follow up. You you can you can do first. Uh, I personally believe, no matter who you are, doesn't matter who's a president, who's a politician, who runs the administration, it doesn't matter what uh, opinions you hold. What's more important is the Uyghurs are still suffering, and the situation has not be, been fixed yet. And doesn't matter what ethnic background you're from, what religious background you're from, doesn't matter what your identity is. We all have the responsibility to speak up for each other. And if even if I'm not Uyghur, I think it is my it is my duty to speak up for um, let's say for for example what is happening in Myanmar, what is happening in um, in 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 in, in um, Yemen. Uh, all these, I do think we all have the responsibility to care for each other because we're all humans in the end of the day. So um, no, I don't think it's a problem that if it's your far left or far, far right, I do think that we all have, the, we all share the same response, responsibility, which is care for each other. And that's what make us a good people. <laughs> well, let me ask this other question. Akita, we'll start with you on this one. It's kind of an interesting question. This is from somebody um, on, again, on the Q&A, who's identified as being Uyghur and says, I used to have many Han Chinese friends, but after 2017, I lost contact with many of them due to various reasons. One main reason is that some of those Han friends have expressed that the re-education camps are a good thing. I wonder if you have encountered similar situations, again, of Han friends defending the, the, the re-education camps. And, and what would you say to a Han Chinese friend who thinks that it is right for the government to detain Uyghurs for, for who they are? Uh, Kato, why don't we start with you and then Johar, if you have some thoughts on it as well. Uh, yes, I would like to answer this question. So from my own experiences, I got several responses when it comes to these issues. When I talk about the re-education camps, about my mother's detains, so I, I become an activist. The first response is, it, it's like, oh, re-education camp. It's not existed. You are just making something up. How could there is still re-education camp in the world? This is something that is created by the Western media. Uh, this is the time I talked to our friends about uh, my mother's might end up in the re-education camps before my mother's news came out. So this is the first response I got. The, another response I might got from the Han Chinese friends is uh, they might already heard about re-education camp issues, but uh, the, they might uh, they might answers like, uh, oh, this is actually uh, 
this is the only way that the governments can maintain the stability of the Xinjiang regions, or this is uh, like by like sacrifice, like it's like the main point, they might not say directly, but the main point behind their response is by sacrificing uh, small groups of people in the re-education camps, we can maintain a happy, successfully mainly like, like we all know this is like mainly Han Chinese happy societies if we do that ways. And uh, this, and they might like the, my, my point is they might, uh, they might respond in a way that is support, be supportive of the Chinese government's approach, but not all the Chinese are like that. Some of my really good Chinese friends, when they heard about the news about the re-education camp, they are like, I am so sorry. I have no idea why our government done something like that. I wish the atrocity of the, I, I, I wish the, like, I wish the suffering of Uyghurs ends soon. I wish that you can see your mothers, all the others Uyghurs can see their loved ones. So, uh, so right now, so our, like for, for all the nations, all the ethnic groups, they have people, like they have different people like people holding different opinions but our job is to tell the truth like so that's why after i became an activist i after i opened the twitter's accounts i advocated in all of the language i can sometimes i advocated in english sometimes i advocated in chinese it doesn't matter whether you understand or whether your support or whether it it doesn't like my like it's your job to differentiate what is good or bad it's your job to become a human but it is my job to tell the truth and advocate it for advocate it about what is going on and encourage all of the people whether you are Uyghurs whether you are others nation whether you are like Americans whether you are Chinese to 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 fight against uh, fight uh, fight against fight against the uh, fight against injustice the justice but it's my job to advocate it and uh, my last i i already talked too much or under too fast i am a little bit excited being so like uh, excited about these issues but uh the last the last uh, few suggestions i wanted to offer to my Chinese friends uh, is first of all the like uh, please don't think this as a propaganda please don't think all of the bad news about China like re-education camp genocide of Uyghur as a propaganda created by the Western media it is the true address this is the true atrocity true tragedy that is happening the reasons why uh, you think that way is because your government your state media only want you to see what they want you to see if they wanted to hide hide the fact hide the hide what they are doing they will create it some things like Uyghurs are living happy they might like um, there is no such a like concentration camp existed whether western media are uh, like attracting us by creating this issue it is not the, please do more research and that second if you decided to choose to stand on stand on justice and uh, stand on justice and please just to support your Uyghur friends by if you can't maybe share the news, share what's happening about on the Uyghurs on your social medias. If you can, please just anonymously write a letters to your local officials in your countries to inform them about the issues. And uh, if you are afraid of doing those steps, be in because fearings of the retaliation from the Chinese governments, you can simply just uh, offer a hug or supportive words to your Uyghur friends and um, tell your Han Chinese friends around you what's happening on Uyghurs and uh, maybe correct the bias that uh, most that some Han Chinese have toward this ish issue. Um, just uh, adding a little more uh, to what Afrika said, and um, so uh, responding to the question directly, that um, so um, the the question was um, 
some people have expressed that re-education camp was a good thing. Um, in my opinion, we're all humans. I, I believe most uh, uh, our roots are all genuine and good, but those people who think it was a good thing, uh, the one of the possible re uh, reason could be they think it is a good thing. Good thing after watching uh, Chinese uh, propaganda videos, which portray it as a positive um, solution to fix Uyghur problems, and um, and a lot of people does do believe that do believe what the Chinese government have been saying that oh those people uh, who are locked up who can actually go home freely and they went in to get free education and those people going there is just to uh, learn how to uh, to improve their job skills and there are people actually genuinely believe that this is true uh, I ha I'm I I'm embarrassed to say that I was one of those people when I was younger in teenage, uh, when I was a teenager, when I was still in China, I believed whatever the CCTV said. CCTV is the Chinese state-backed media. And I believed, oh, since it's the official news, it must be the truth. But in fact, that's not always the case. And after coming to the U.S., when I had access to all sorts of media, it doesn't matter if it's left views or right views, at least I had access to all of them. But in China, you only have uh, one voice. Um, in my opinion, um, a normal society does not only have one voice because people are born to be different and we are, we're, we're born to have different opinions. And but in China, all the news they it's it's made to uh, to to shape people to think in the exact same way. So uh, I don't I am not surprised if there are lots of Han Chinese inside China would think or even outside of China, people who believe that those camps are uh, are for for Uyghur people's own good. Uh, and that is why I believe what we need to do is to provide with them with actual evidence and uh, more resources, more information, since uh, you'll be surprised, a lot of Chinese friends I have, until now, they do not use any Western uh, social media or Western search engines. They still use Baidu instead of Google, even though on Baidu, everything is san sanctioned or everything is censored. A lot of things will be blocked, but they still would be um, more comfortable with using um, uh, using Baidu, which I understand, and um, that is why I I encourage people to you know talk to uh, talk to them calmly instead of accusing them for thinking in certain ways, and try to persuade them with actual facts and make sure to use the right sources and 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 fact check your sources too because. It could hurt. Uh, eventually, if you um, sometimes it could hurt the Uyghur cause even more if you, um, just sometimes if you don't verify your source and it could use against the Uyghurs. It could be used against the Uyghurs in the end. In the in in the end, so so I really do encourage if there are so many uh, credible accounts of uh, refugees stories that you can share. Um, uh, and um, it is quite sad. And there are documentaries. And I am also personally working on a documentary film where my film crew had flew to uh, six, seven different countries, including China, including the, uh, and they even went into the Uyghur region to have uh, film footages. And we have um, done tons of interviews uh, with camp survivors, with family members of, of former detainees. So I really do uh, insist on people and keep trying, do not lose hope, uh, do not lose hope in humanity. Let's be positive. Thank you. We're getting a few questions kind of shifting a little bit. I'm trying to be mindful of the, the time too. Um, about some advocacy, some questions from people who are doing advocacy, who want to help with advocacy um, and, and, and support it. Um, and um, so there is, you know, one question um, is about types of advocacy uh, that, that you've seen or that you've had to seem to be successful. It even excites you that you think that this is really um, so, so type of advocacy that's moving in the right direction. Um, and and a, a related question is um, could, that some people, you know, many people here are concerned that the advocacy they might do from here might bring harm to people who are in the country or the family members, be it your family members in, uh, that, that are still there or, or family members of other 
uh, Uyghur scholars in this case. And um, so what kind of advocacy do you think is, a, is effective and that you've seen exciting, but also what are the risks that, that go on particularly for family members, especially in such a heavily surveilled country where it went and everything? Uh, so this question, so uh, I'm not sure if I understand, like if I understand these questions correctly or if I can uh, make to the point, but I will try to answer that. So in terms of the advocacy, like first of all, like let's talk about whether this advocacy would be harmful or non-harmful. When I first started my activism or when I first started to uh, do something for my mothers, I care a little bit too much about whether these actions would be harmful or in the Chinese government's eye and uh, like I should be careful about that, I should be careful about this. So now what I'm careful is, am I doing the right thing? Am I, am I, am I doing the something that a true human, a good human will do? So instead of worrying about this advocacy will piss Chinese government off, I will just think about I am whether I'm doing all good things or not. So I will just speak out every truth I have. I will just uh, attend it every event that people can be can be educated, that I can raise more awareness on my mother issue, on my weaker issues, and uh, and so came to the point. My point right now is all of the advocacy that is uh, that doesn't include any discriminations towards any ethnic groups, that is telling the truth, that is raising the awareness on the current issues, that is the advocacy that is worth doing. Um, I agree with Akita that telling the truth is could be one of the best um, campaign uh, or advocacy tactics. And I also believe that there is no one single best way for campaigning or for act activism. Um, I personally believe that all advocacy work is the best. Um, they're all are, are great. And um, you will never know in, in different cases, you will never know which uh, which activity that you did uh, for activism could could uh, uh, could cause a change? And I, in fact, I think um, it, all these activities that you do together can pile up and make a change. It could happen today, it could happen tomorrow, it could happen in ten years. But eventually, you will see the change. It's just a matter of time. And um, what matters the most for me is the consistency. Um, I do see people would um, speak up on this issue, but often after two weeks, after three weeks, after a year, people would give up because they don't see a positive change and they get disappointed or they move on to another issue. Not that I think another issue is less important. Uh, I personally believe that every humanitarian uh, issue is it's very important. And it is um, that I, I do believe that we should... Um, as I mentioned earlier, we should, it's our responsibility to care for each other. It doesn't matter which ethnic background you are from, which religious group you're from, which gender group you're from. So I, uh, what I suggest is consistency. People, they can constantly uh, focusing on, 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 on the issue that you care about and uh, constantly, uh, doesn't matter which, which tactic, which way you choose, just continue and do not give up. And, um, or, uh, I forgot what was the second part of the question. Uh, it was about just the risk to people. Oh yes, you know, you know in, in, yeah. still in China. Um, that's actually one of my fear every single day um, until today, until at this moment speaking with you right now, make me um, have sometimes would have goosebumps or make me feel cold because I am afraid. What if I said this? What if this thing that I said would cause this 
damage or that damage to my family? What happened? Will they t take away my my brother's um, rights to go to school because they did it with me before they tried to threaten my student status with my father? And will they do that to me? Well, uh, to, to my brothers, will they um, take away my stepmom's job? Will they harm my, my, my other family relatives? Will they do this? Well, it's, it's, I'm in constant fear, but I have come this far. I didn't come this far just to come this far to stop. Uh, I will continue and I am a very greedy person. Uh, I haven't seen a positive change yet. I am not going to stop until I get what I want. Yeah. So um, as a quick follow-up, and then I think we have, I mean, there's a lot of questions, but just because of time, let me try to go with two more questions after this. But but as part of this, you've also put yourselves at some risk um, to, um, with, with this as well. So now obviously there is... Um, you, you know, you both sort of indicated that you probably are not going to be going back to China, able to go back to China safely in, in the near future. Um, anyhow, did you, have you, Akita, you talked a little bit about it, but, but feel free to, to jump in. Do, do you worry, you know, how, at what point did you decide the risk that I had no choice but to take this risk for yourself? For... Uh, mm. When I first started, instead of thinking about me, I think more about like whether my actions would bring risk to my parents or my mm -hmm. like this, like whether it's like may, maybe my mothers would suffer more or maybe my fathers would detain more, be detained too. So that's why I speak out. That's why I, that's also why I was silenced at the beginnings. Uh, so the reason why I started to speak out and I think that's a good time is the first is I lost the hope of the Chinese governments to unconditionally release my mothers and uh, I also was afraid that is if I don't speak up if I don't speak if I just stay silent and if my mother ended up perish or just to, like, I don't want to put it this way, but if my mother's just to die or just to, like, just to, like, have any serious problems in the concentration camp or prisons, where, wherever she is currently in, I would not forgive, I, I, will, I won't forgive myself forever. So that's why I decided to speak out. And I also think, since I am the only, like in my family, I am the only, I am the only family member that is currently living in an, a foreign country, in a foreign country. I had this responsibility to speak up for my mother. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with uh, what everything after that just said that um, I also had that thought if I, remain silent um, because I was afraid. I will, I, I know for a fact that I will be, I will feel the regret every single minute in the rest of my life. And also, yeah, I had uh, times that I was worried for my own safety and, and well, as what my father said, well, everything, every problem has a solution. And, and, and when you see a problem, you need to fix it or try to come up with a solution. So I did uh, imagine myself being kidnapped one day or, well, I, um, I practiced judo and jujitsu and that's my solution. And I constantly work out. So I'm a very strong woman. So, uh, and I try my best to, to be safe. And, um, and I am very careful with, 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 with um, my, uh, my words as well. And um I, as long as I don't do anything illegal, then, then should be fine. <laughs> and just to clarify, your family is all still in China. You're also the only family member that, that's, that's here. Okay, I want to ask two more questions uh, that came out of the, the group, and then um, and then we will um, thank you for being here. And and Claire, I'm going to ask you to come in on this question too. And this comes from Louisa Grieve at, at UHRP. Um, and the question is, um, 
what is the responsibility of American universities um, and scholars who have cooperation with the Chinese Ministry of Ed Education at a time when so many Uyghur and Kazakh university professors and teachers are victims of a genocide? For example, should they do the same thing as the clothing companies, cut off ties with the ministry that is complicit um, in genocide? And obviously, Claire, you might be able to help us with the SAR, some thoughts from the SAR position, but also, you know, we should not forget that we have the daughters of two scholars here um, who are, uh, you know, who, who very much were persecuted in that same um, context. I'm happy to start. Um, I mean, it's a, I don't think that there is a clear answer. Um, however, I would say that um, in in our experience, it's better to keep a, a door open for conversation to ensure that you have the ability to ask questions, ask you know, government officials why, give them an opportunity to explain even if, you know, even if you think you know the answer, even if we are disappointed with the answer, but to maintain an, an opportunity to you know, ask questions and maintain dialogue is incredibly important. So, in general, and I'm sure there are exceptions, in, in general, you know, we find that boycotts and similar actions are less useful um, because they don't allow you to have a dialogue about an issue. Um, it's, I mean, uh, that being said, this is an incredibly difficult and severe you know, situation and people's lives are at stake. And so I can see where some nuance in that strategy would be necessary. Um, you know, I, I, however, I think those who do have you know, relationships with government officials in China um, should, before choosing to cut any ties, ask them, why are you doing this? And um, please stop. And so using that relationship to your advantage is um, you know, where possible, incredibly important. Um, but I would love to hear from Jahar and Akita as well on that question. Uh, I really agree with what Claire said that, um, uh, first of all, I think the US education system is ha highly valued in China. Um, that is why there's so many parents in China have been trying to send their kids to, to, to US to seek for higher education. And uh, therefore, I think there's a leverage, there's leverage there. And if you com co completely cut off and let's say boycott it, then you can't ask Ch the Chinese government to do anything. Um, that is why I, as Claire said, that um, then there's, there won't be any room to, for discussion. And I think, um, well, my father, his, his key, his key is always a uh, dialogue. Uh, he always promotes dialogue. And I do believe the 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 value um, the importance of dialogue and um, I think um, completely cutting off any ties with China with throughout the education system it's, might do more harm than good and uh, yeah that's just my personal uh, perspective. Um, did you did you have something to add, Akita? I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I can add some for what the the institutions, university can do. So, uh, if so, one of the things like I live the like I live near the University of Washington, and uh, I really hope that the school the schools can host more like events about the Uyghur issues and educated people on the campus, educated the officials in the schools about what is happening to Uyghurs. If this is happening, I will be, I will leave all of my works and just jump into the campus to be a speaker. But I didn't see this kind of activity going on in the campus. And I hope that the Stu like students associations in the campus can also 
to host more events about the Uyghurs issue, like this crisis and uh, like educating, like take this responsibility, but I still didn't see uh, act this actions, actions going on. And so what I suggest is except all of the things that Jeff Harris and the Claire's talk about, one thing to add is the institutions might create, I might host more events to educated people on what's happening. And uh, this is also okay, one of the ways to pressure the Chinese government to stop these atrocities. And uh, also, uh, also we cannot blame, I, can, I don't want to blame this, blame this on the university itself. I think I also need to take the responsibility. So my responsibility right now is since the institutions or student associations didn't take this responsibility, haven't taken this responsibility, I will send a letter to the student associations. I will contact the univers like universities and I will ask them and uh, like, hey, this is what's going on on Uyghurs. Could you create events related to that? To that related, uh, could you could you host an event to educate people on what's going on? And I hope all the people who want to help in Uyghur issues can also do that. Yeah, thanks. And you've both been so um, generous with your time to so many, I know, institutions and classes to help um, um, to, to help keep this conversation going and the dialogue going and keeping it in, in the air. Um, I want to close with, uh, a, a, there, there's a, a lot of variations of this question I'm going to ask. And the simple one is, how do you stay hopeful? Um, how do you, um, um, you know, how, how do you, how do you, what do you hope for as an imagined world? How, how do you keep believing it, it, it will get there? Um, we, uh, there's, um, um, yeah, I, I won't read you all the questions, but that's sort of the, there's several questions of just, how do you keep going? How, how do you, how do you stay hoping, stay hopeful when you see so much, um, so much going on that, that must um, be discouraging, you know, um, in the world and in your and with your families and, and everything. Um, uh, I'd like to answer it with a little humor, and I guess it runs in my blood. The positivity just runs in my blood. I got it from my father. He was a very very positive man. And um, the night after he was sentenced, I'm just sharing this little anecdote. Uh, the night after he's sentenced, when he was sentenced for life, my father told his lawyer, thank God, alhamdulillah, this is the only, this is the one, the first time I was able to have a good night's sleep after the nine months of being arrested, the detention of nine months. And the lawyer was shocked that he just got sentenced to, to life. Why did you, were you able to uh, sleep well? And my father's answer was, I wasn't given, given a death penalty. It's just life sentence. There's still hope. And my father's a very hope. He always kept, kept himself very hopeful. And he always told me to be positive growing up. That's how he raised me. And I... Uh, I see someone asked um, in in the in the questions that uh, if the um, do you see the light at the end of the tunnel and would you continue advocating for Uyghurs even when your parents are released one day? I would like to answer to that. Um, I do believe one day my father will be released, and I do believe Akhida's mother will be released one day. And I I know that that day will definitely come. It's a matter of time. And I will continue. I believe I think I will, uh, I, I'm, I'm not gonna speak for you, but I, I myself, I will continue my fight until I see every single innocent Uyghur is released. And it is my duty as a human being.
I guess this is my turn to speak out about this. And my answer is similar to Jahel. So first of all, why I stay positive is because I need energy to fulfill my responsibilities. Right now, it's like uh, I have a big, like big rock on my shoulders and uh, I need to carry this rock on my own. So if I don't stay positive and uh, if I don't stay energetic, I won't finish enough activism for my, peer, for my, for my family members. And uh, if I, this is what Chinese government wants. They want me to devastate it, lose all of the hopes and stop doing what I am doing. That is why it's in, that is why it's like, aside from my activism, I also do something funny to cheer myself up, like watching a cat's videos or doing anything I want. And of the reasons I'm still hopeful to the humanity is everything's have two sides. Like we see the attack, we see the persecutions, we see some ignorance from peoples, but we also see some support We some encouraging world war worlds. And even some people, they are not Uyghurs, but they are dedicating their times. Like all of the, pa all of the panelists, all of the like people who are attending these events, they wanted to devote their times to care for and ethnic groups who is currently going through going through going through such a horrible thing so i think i should focus on those focus my attention to those good people and uh, believe in in humanity we believe in the humanity thank you and you know for you, the the, the hope and positivity that you both bring to this is so important for all of the people who you who you're talking about that um, um, that that want to help and work where who feel so that it feels so impossible to some of us and um, and yet seeing your hope and your positivity and your belief in in change and the belief you'll see your parents and the belief you know that I have that I will meet both of your parents which I cannot wait to do um, inspires people like me and, and all these other people that Akita mentioned to, 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 to keep doing the work. Um, I apologize for all the quest people we didn't get to questions to. It's, we've been about an hour and 15 minutes now. Um, so I think we're, we're nearing the end, but I wanna turn it back over to Betsy to, to, to close us out here. Claire, did you have any final remarks before I close us out? I, I just echo Adam and mainly want to say thank you to everybody for your time and especially to you, Jahar and Akita and Betsy and Adam, but to Jahar and Akita most especially for sharing these insights and helping us all you know, do what we can to support you and your father and your mother. And um, because we want to, we want to help. And I'm, I'm sure that the many students and partners on this call feel the same way. So please do let us know um, when there's an opportunity for action. And I just would like to add um, Johar and Akita, um, you two are remarkable women and just, um, I'm so, so honored that you're here tonight and you really lit the light of, of activism in me. <laughs> and um, I, I think I, the word does need to be spread to a lot of people, I was talking to my family about it today and they really knew very little. So I think we all, as much as we can, need to go out and talk about this issue. Um, so I do hope we'll see you again soon and you'll come back for another um, talking in the library. <laughs> Johar has been here for a couple of them already. And um, to all of our participants, thank you so much for coming. Um, and I hope you got as much out of this as we did. And um, please pay attention to the library website where we'll have future events like this. Thank you so much, everybody.